So today we'll hear from Dr. Andrew Kolodny, Medical Director for the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative at Brandeis University. Dr. Kolodny is one of the nation's leading experts on the prescription opioid and heroin crisis. His primary area of focus is the prescription opioid and heroin crisis devastating families and communities across the country. Dr. Kolodny has been serving as an expert witness on behalf of state governments in litigation against opioid manufacturers, distributors, and re retailers. These efforts have resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars in settlement funds and have helped raise awareness about the role, uh, um, about the, role the defendants played in causing the opioid crisis. He is currently the president of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, or PROP, and vice president, Federal Affairs for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, an organization with a mission to reduce morbidity and mortality caused by overprescribing of opioid analgesics. Dr. Claudney, take it away. Thank you for having me. I am going to go pretty quickly through at least the uh, first half of the slides so that we have um, some time to talk about FDA and also I'd like to be able to answer questions. So uh, this is a very old slide. The CDC came out with this slide about, um, I guess, more than 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, there was a three-year lag in their data. And so uh, when the CDC came out with this slide in 2010, the most current data they had was from 2007. The CDC, when it began showing uh, this slide, um, it was responding to criticism uh, that it was using the term epidemic to describe the opioid crisis. And in, in response to the critics, uh, the CDC said, hey, we're the CDC, we don't use the term epidemic lightly. The opioid crisis is an epidemic. And then they went even further. They said, not only is this an epidemic, it's the worst drug epidemic in United States history. And that was the point that they're making uh, with this slide. And of course, the criticism uh, that the CDC was getting for using the term epidemic was coming from pain organizations funded by opioid manufacturers. So the CDC responded by putting out this slide and saying, not only is this an epidemic, it's the worst drug epidemic in the United States history. And that was the point they were making here, the box on the left that says heroin, uh, that's showing you the rate of drug overdose deaths during the height of the heroin epidemic in the 1970s. The box to the right is the crack cocaine epidemic you can see rate of drug overdose deaths uh, during the height of that epidemic. And then you could see that uh, following those epidemics, overdose deaths increased substantially. In fact, uh, in 2007, the last year for which there's data on this slide, there were more overdose deaths than we had in the height of those two previous epidemics combined. Now, um, this slide, as I mentioned, is very old. What I'd like you to recognize is that in 2008, that last blue column to the right went higher. In 2009, it went up again. In 2010, it went up. Every year, really for the past 25 years, overdose deaths have gone up. Every year, we've set a new record for deaths from drug overdose in the United States, and then we break that record. Now, this slide is not showing you the specific drugs that are involved in the deaths, so we have to sort of uh, dive down a little deeper. Uh, this is showing you the drugs that were involved in deaths up until 2010. So again, this is also an old slide. Um, on this slide, you can see that overdose deaths involving prescription opioids are shown in red. Overdose deaths involving heroin, which is obviously an opioid, are, are shown in green at the bottom. Um, you could see the gray line representing benzodi benzodiazepines and um, the blue line for cocaine, which had come up and then come down. What this is really telling us, though, is that up until 2010, what was driving that increase that you saw on the previous slide was prescription opioids. That picture has changed recently. This is the, the most current data available uh, uh, from the CDC. Uh, in, in a few days, we'll get the next month's data. Uh, and this is showing us the opioids that are most likely to be found in the toxicology report of an overdose decedent. And um, the black line here represents total opioid overdose deaths. The brown line represents fentanyl. Orange is prescription. Blue is heroin. Uh, 
Um, and what you can see is that opioid overdose deaths today are dominated by fentanyl. And mo almost all of that fentanyl would be illicitly synthesized fentanyl, not fentanyl uh, from patches or from, from sublingual fentanyl products. So the, the picture has changed quite a bit. Now, just coming back a little bit, um, this is sort of the, you know, stepping back and looking at the overall trends. What you can see here is that the blue line at the top, that's prescription opioids. That's really what drove the increase and was the, the opioid most likely to be found in a toxicology report up until around 2015 when fentanyl surpassed uh, prescription opioids. You'll also see a dark blue line that starts going up around 2012 uh, and that's heroin. And often you'll see this slide explained as three waves of the epidemic. You'll hear it described as the prescription opioid wave, followed by the heroin wave, that dark blue line, followed by the fentanyl wave. And in, in general, I don't think it's very helpful to frame the crisis in that way. Um, and, and you'll understand in a moment how I think it, it, it's more accurate to frame the problem. But often that three waves uh, framework is used to explain a, a narrative that's not accurate. What you'll often hear is that drug users in the United States switched from prescription opioids to heroin because the, the pills dr dried up, there was a crackdown in the pills. So the drug users switched to heroin and, and then they switched to fentanyl uh, which is more um, certainly is more uh, dangerous than than heroin, and and that's why we've seen deaths go up. the The problem with that narrative is it suggests that we've had this sort of homogenous group of drug users in the United States sort of switching from one drug to another based on availability, which is not correct. We have an important epidemiology of opioid use disorder in the United States which we'll look at it at a moment. We don't have an, a homogenous group switching from, from one drug to another. Um, the other problem with that narrative is it implies that the switching occurred around the time that the deaths involving illicit opioids start going up, and that's also not accurate. What we've seen in the past several years with deaths involving fentanyl um, has been this sharp increase in, in overdose deaths um, but that doesn't necessarily mean there was a sudden switching. What really happens around 2015, uh, really starts happening around 2014, is we have a sudden increase in the dangerousness of the supply, not necessarily a sudden increase in people switching from one drug to another. I'll explain that in a, in a moment. Actually, you can see on, on this slide. So this notion that drug users in the United States started switching to heroin and fentanyl in 2014, 2015 uh, isn't accurate. Um, the switching from prescription opioids happened much earlier. Uh, the graph on the right is blacks, the graph on the left is whites, the color of the lines are referring to age groupings. Um, if you start by just looking at the red line, that's whites in the United States, uh, actually, the, the red line is people ages 20 to 34. Um, if you look on the right, that's blacks ages 20 to 34, you'll see no real rising use of heroin. Um, and you'll see among uh, blacks uh, for heroin, the, the age group with the most use is 45 and up. We'll, we'll come back to that in a moment. For whites, young whites, 20 to 34, you see heroin use was rising from the early 2000s. And these were young white people who were switching from prescription opioids to heroin, again, from the very beginning of the prescription opioid crisis. Um, these were young people who had become addicted to prescription opioids that they had been taking either because they liked the effect, basically using them non-medically, recreationally, and that's how they got addicted. Or they were young people who might have been prescribed into addiction, a young person with a chronic medical problem. Um, or maybe a serious injury was put on long-term opioids and became addicted, or they were young people who became addicted sort of in a sort of a combination of those two ways, maybe a young person with a brief medical exposure, wisdom teeth, minor sports injury, didn't get addicted from that brief medical exposure, but got their first taste of the drug from a doc or a dentist, and um, then used recreationally and, and got hooked. Now, for these young people who got addicted and now need to maintain their supply because they're addicted, 
Um, and once you're addicted, if you don't maintain your supply, you're going to be feeling very ill. Uh, and, and not just flu-like symptoms, but severe anxiety when you're going into withdrawal. A, a sense of impending doom is, is the term that's used to describe uh, the way people are feeling. It's, it's akin to a panic attack. People feel like they're going to die. Um, and it's why they'll do desperate things to maintain their supply. And for these young people who became addicted, even if their addiction began through medical use, they and even back in the early 2000s, they often had a hard time obtaining pills from doctors. Even in the early 2000s, doctors were not comfortable giving healthy looking 25 year olds a large quantity of opioids on a on a monthly basis. So these were young people who wound up on the black market. And even in the early 2000s, the pills were very expensive on the black market. An 80 milligram Oxycontin was selling for $80 a pill, a dollar a milligram. It's still a dollar a milligram. So if anything, it's become a little less expensive if you're controlling for, for inflation. The 30 milligram immediate release Oxycodone, one of the most popular uh, prescription opioids on the black market, sells for about $30 today. So. If that young person who got addicted to prescription opioids was in a region of the country where heroin was available, they'd switch uh, because it will produce the same effect as a prescription opioid and it was much cheaper. And what we saw happening steadily, not suddenly in 2012 or 13 when heroin deaths started going up, but steadily uh, from the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis is heroin begins moving into more regions of the country where it was not previously available to meet demand for it by this growing number of young people who had become addicted uh, to prescription opioids. Now, if you look at the green line for white people, again, the graph on the left, you see 45 and up, you see no rising use of heroin there. And these are middle-aged and older folks. Um, the fact that there's been no rise in heroin use really doesn't mean that they haven't it's a group that hasn't been affected by the opioid crisis in fact middle-aged white people in the united states have been one of the groups hit especially hard you haven't really seen and to this day we haven't much seen that much uh heroin use among middle-aged and older white people who became addicted to prescription opioids because this is a group that has generally been able to get pills more easily from doctors uh, less easily today than they were previously, uh, but this is a group that even when their primary care doc or geriatrician might have become nervous if the patient's coming in too early, asking for higher and higher doses, um, usually the patient will attribute that behavior to worsening of pain. These were patients getting referred to pain management, rarely for, for addiction treatment. And before fentanyl emerged, before the black market supply became so exceptionally dangerous, when you looked at where we were seeing the most overdose deaths, if, for example, you were to compare the older white group that got pills more easily from doctors to the younger white group that was winding up on the black market uh, buying heroin, we were seeing substantially more overdose deaths in this older white group that was getting a clean supply of prescription opioids from from doctors, far more deaths than we were seeing in the, in the young, younger white group switching to, to the black market. Of course, that changes uh, in, in a dramatic way once the black market supply becomes exceptionally dangerous, again, because of the emergence of illicitly synthesized fentanyl. There is a third group of opioid addicted Americans. I touched on it a moment ago, um, but it's a group that gets the least amount of attention and these are older non-white, uh, this is an older non-white group, mostly Blacks um, in their 50s and up. Many of these individuals are survivors of the heroin epidemic of the 1970s. Some of them became addicted to opioids during the 1980s, um, uh, and, and some uh, even during the crack cocaine epidemic became newly heroin addicted. This is an older non-white uh, non group of longtime heroin users who because, again, because of the emergence of fentanyl, um, there's been a, a very heavy toll taken on that population. So I'm gonna sum up the epidemiology quickly before I move on. Um, we roughly have three groups of opioid addicted Americans. A, the first group is disproportionately white. Their addiction began after 1995, that's a key date, which we'll come back to. 
uh, and um, their addiction began with prescription opioids and they've it's a group that switched to heroin and that switching has been happening for more than a decade. Uh, then we have a middle-aged and older disproportionately white group also became addicted uh, uh, through use of prescription opioids after 1995 and it's a group that hasn't really been switching to the black market for heroin uh, in large numbers. Uh, certainly there is some switching in that population. And then um, we have this older non-white group that was addicted before 1995 and, and their addiction began with, with heroin use. Now, fentanyl has been taking a, a very heavy toll on group number one and group number three, because these are heroin using groups. And we've seen a skyrocketing in overdose deaths in, in these heroin using groups, group number, number one and number three. In that middle group, uh, the uh, middle-aged and older, disproportionately white group, we, we've, w that group appears to actually be doing a bit better now that prescribing has been trending in a more cautious direction. And it's a group that has not been switching to, to heroin in large numbers. So let's just talk quickly about framing of the opioid crisis. These are headlines that would appear in media coverage of the, the opioid crisis. Um, we talk about the opioid crisis frequently. The term, again, appears frequently in the media, but I think people mean different things when they use the term. So I want to be clear, at least what I'm referring to when I say the term opioid crisis, and, and really what I think is the most accurate way to frame the problem. I think the, the way to frame this problem, the way to frame the opioid crisis is as an epidemic of opioid use disorder, or as an epidemic of opioid addiction, and I think we can use those terms interchangeably. Um, when I say that the opioid crisis should be framed as an epidemic of opioid addiction, what I'm saying is that the reason that the United States is experiencing record high levels of opioid related overdose deaths, the reason we've seen heroin and fentanyl flood into non urban areas across the United States, the reason we've experienced a soaring increase in infants born opioid dependent, outbreaks of injection related infectious diseases, children winding up in foster care, impact on the workforce. The driver behind all of these different health and social problems that we're referring to when we talk about the opioid crisis has been an increase in the prevalence of opioid addiction in the United States. So from 1999 to 2011, a 900% increase in opioid use disorder in the United States measured through, through treatment seeking. The wrong way to frame the opioid crisis is as an epidemic of drug abuse. This is not an epidemic of people taking drugs because it feels good and they're accidentally killing themselves. This is not an epidemic of people saying, hey, shooting up fentanyl would be a fun way to spend a Friday night, so let's go get some fentanyl. What we know is that the vast majority of the deaths occur in people who are opioid addicted, not every death. We've seen a dramatic increase in deaths in teenagers experimenting with um, uh, illicit drugs, uh, counterfeit pills that have fentanyl in it. Um, and so about a 100% increase in deaths in that population but even with a 100% increase, it really only accounts for a very small percentage, about 1% of the total drug overdose deaths in the United States. Studies of overdose decedents tell us that the vast majority are likely to be suffering from opioid addiction. So what caused our opioid crisis? And this is going to get us to the topic of FDA's regulatory failure. Um, what caused the opioid crisis was a dramatic increase in the prescribing of, of opioids. And you see that uh, with this green line. The green line here, this is a, a CDC slide. The green line is showing you sales for prescription opioids. And here the red line is showing you deaths involving prescription opioids. And the blue line is showing you addiction. And you can see that the three lines went up together. And when the CDC put this slide together, this was one of, for many years, one of its chief speaking points about the opioid crisis. The message for the medical community was that the overprescribing of opioids was really causing this red line and the blue line go, go, to go up. That if we really wanted to 
turn things around, we needed to see opioid consumption start to come down. Um, I could tell you that the opioid industry certainly has not agreed with the CDC. I started by saying that they were attacking the CDC going back more than a decade for even using the term epidemic. Uh, certainly as these three lines were going up, uh, the industry was putting out papers saying this isn't happening. There was a, a paper published in JAMA around 2002 saying that the prescribing is going up, but there's no evidence of any increase in adverse public health harms. Of, of course, they were leaving data out. Um, a few, uh, maybe about a decade ago, the industry stopped claiming that these three lines were not going up together, but started to say that, well, yeah, they're going up together, but instead of having doctors prescribe less, what we can do is make the pills harder to crush for snorting or injecting so-called abuse deterrent formulations and then we can have our cake and eat it too the the prescribing can continue to go up and we can make the red line and the blue line go go down of course um that would would never work and making a pill harder to crush for snorting or injecting is not making a pill less addictive most people who become addicted become addicted swallowing the pills. And again, this is an epidemic of opioid addiction. One of the things you need to do to bring epidemics under control is to prevent people from getting the disease. Abuse deterrent formulations don't, don't prevent opioid addiction. The pharmaceutical industry wasn't just saying these things. Uh, they were putting their money where their mouth is. This is data that comes from an investigation by the Associated Press and the Center of Public Integrity. They looked at uh, spending uh, from the opioid industry uh, to block efforts by federal and state governments that would have resulted in more cautious prescribing efforts that would have helped bring that green line down. They found that over a 10 year period, $880 million was spent. That's eight times more than the gun lobby was spending trying to block controls on guns and 200 times more than Organizations like my organization, Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, uh, was spending in trying to promote more, more cautious use of, of opioids. Uh, so let's go back a little bit to what was driving the, the increase in prescribing. And this is just a, another slide. This is also old. Um, uh, the, th this is showing you oxycodone consumption in the United States, the blue line compared to oxycodone consumption in Europe. And what I can tell you is that um, th uh, since this slide was made over the past seven years or so, the blue line for oxycodone has continued to come down in the United States, although since COVID, it doesn't seem to be coming down much anymore. Um, the red line for Europe has been going up because of efforts to promote opioids in Europe that have been very successful. Um, despite the rise in Europe and the decrease in the United States, the U.S. continues to prescribe and consume far more opioids than any other country. Um, but you know, there are really two points I wanted to make with this slide. One is you can see the dramatic difference in per capita opioid consumption between the U.S. and Europe. But the other point is this really shows us where the, the prescribing of oxycodone takes off. And you see it's really around the year 1995-1996 which is why when we talk about the epidemiology of opioid addiction in the United States, those dates are so important. Uh, some of you may know that 1996 was the first year that OxyContin was on the market, uh, which contains oxycodone in it. So before 1996, you're pretty much looking at Percocet, and then you have the introduction of OxyContin, which packs a whopping dose of oxycodone in it. It's being very widely prescribed. And you could look at this and say, well, you know, this is all explained by the introduction of OxyContin. But 1996 was not just the year that oxycodone goes up. 1996 was also the year that hydrocodone goes up, morphine goes up, hydromorphone goes up, fentanyl goes up, fentanyl patch goes up. Um, every opioid that was on the market before 1996, that 1996 is the inflection point where we start to see this sharp rise. It sort of begs the question of what was going on uh, that led to this dramatic change in the way the medical community was prescribing opioids. And um, what, what was going on was we had this campaign launched 
where the medical community really starts to hear from many different directions that patients have been suffering needlessly because of an overblown fear of addiction. Um, we start hearing, uh, we hear the use of the term opiophobia, which is totally inappropriate to use that term. Phobia, when you apply it, when you attach the phobia, that means that, um, that, that means an irrational fear. Um, it's certainly not irrational to be fearful or concerned about a drug that's highly addictive and that can easily lead to overdose death. It's one of the more dangerous medicines that doctors will prescribe. Um, we start hearing that the rate of addiction is very low, that much less than 1% of patients will get addicted to opioids. Some of you may be familiar with the famous Porter and Jick um, one paragraph letter to the editor that was cited as if it was a landmark study that proved that you, know, you don't have to worry about getting patients addicted. We start hearing that physical, physical dependence is nothing to worry about. Patients can come off very easily. This, of course, is totally false. And just as the medical community um, underestimated uh, um, or overestimated the, the benefits of using opioids long term because of this campaign, today I think the medical community is really underestimating how hard it is for patients to come off of opioids. And part of the reason we're underestimating it is that the, this messaging was that, you know, don't worry about physiological dependence that when the time comes, patients can be easily tapered off. We, we heard physical dependence to opioids compared to caffeine or antihypertensives, um, which of, are, of course are, are totally different and, and much uh, easier to come off of. Uh, and of course, the messaging was that opioids are safe and effective for, for chronic pain. Again, this is not true. We don't have evidence that opioids are safe and effective for long-term use. The evidence is that long-term use of opioids for, for chronic non-cancer pain is not safe or effective, and we'll come back to that. So, of, of course, if it was just drug reps visiting doctors, uh, sending the messages you saw on the previous slide, I think the medical community would have been less gullible. But the messages were coming to us from pain patient organizations that looked like grassroots organizations advocating for pain patients, but these were astroturf organizations artificially created by industry. We were hearing these messages from the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the, the American Pain Society, professional societies that, uh, for, the, for example, the APS, which launched the Pain is the Fifth Vital Sign campaign, organizations that put out a consensus statement calling for much greater uh, opioid use, Organi professional societies that were taking millions from opioid manufacturers and not just Purdue Pharma, but other opioid manufacturers. The Joint Commission, which had a financial relationship with Purdue Pharma when it introduced the pain standards requiring hospitals to treat pain like a vital sign, I was also part of this campaign. And we had state medical boards who were hearing from their trade association, the Federation of State Medical Boards, that there's a chilling effect in America that doctors want to give their back pain patients and their fibromyalgia patients lots of opioids, but they're worried they're going to get into trouble with you, the medical board. Um, and so medical boards fell for it, and they issued new medical board policies telling doctors that they will not be sanctioned based on the quantity or doses, but they would be sanctioned for undertreatment of pain. And of course, the Federation of State Medical Boards, again, the Trade Association for State Medical Boards, was taking millions from opioid manufacturers and not just Purdue Pharma. Uh, fortunately, we've seen lawsuits across the country against um, opioid manufacturers. Purdue was very clever. They went, they, they put themselves into bankruptcy uh, when the litigation began. They paid off one state and then went into bankruptcy um, where they've been since. So they, they've removed themselves from the opioid litigation. Um, but for many uh, other entities, um, including some of the chain pharmacies like Walgreens, uh, uh, we, we've seen large um, settlements, uh, which have been helpful because it's providing funds now for states to, to address the opioid crisis. So what is the evidence on long-term use of opioids for, for chronic pain? Uh, AHRQ did a, uh, a systematic review of all of the published evidence on long-term use of opioids. They did this first in 2015, uh, and it was used to inform the 2016 CDC guideline. HRQ repeated this in 2020, and, and their review in 2020 was used uh, 
to inform the 2022 CDC guideline. And what have these AHRQ reviews found? They have found that we do not have adequate evidence that long-term use of opioids is safe and effective. What we do have evidence of though is that it's dangerous and that the higher the dose, the more, more dangerous it is. And you know, if you think about any medical intervention, uh, if you think about you know, even a surgical intervention, if you don't have evidence that a particular treatment is going to help a patient, if you don't have evidence that a surgical procedure is going to help your patient, but you have very good evidence that that surgical procedure is dangerous, you know, th these are treatments we should prescribe rarely, but to this day, we are still routinely putting on opi putting patients on opioids long-term for chronic pain. We're doing it a lot less frequently in 2023 than we were doing it in say 2012, um, but we're still doing it uh, far too often. We are still prescribing opioids much too aggressively, which means we're still getting patients stuck on long-term opioids. The CDC has stated, you know, pretty clearly, um, they're, they're, I'll, I'll, and this is a quote from the CDC, the science of opioids for chronic pain is clear. For the vast majority of patients, the known serious and too often fatal risks far outweigh the unproven and transient benefits. Now this statement is at odds with the current labeling on, on opioid analgesics. So we, we have a statement from the CDC that this is not safe and effective for a condition where, the, where drugs are promoted. And we have a federal law that says you don't let drug makers promote products for conditions where they're not proven safe and effective. And this is in this specific statement that appears here uh, comes out of um, a commentary written by the CDC when it rolled out its guideline in 2016. This was a commentary in the New England Journal of Medicine that the current FDA commissioner um, agreed with. In fact, he had the opportunity to read this before it was published and, and, and said he had agreed with the statement. The VA and Department of Defense has um, issued a guideline, you know, um, it just recently issued um, an updated guideline a few months ago uh, on opioid use for chronic pain um, with this statement. We recommend against the initiation of opioid therapy for the management of chronic non-cancer pain. And this was the same recommendation it had in its 2017 uh, guideline. And it issued this recommendation, um, it characterized the different recommendations in its guideline as, as weak, modest, or strong. This was a strong recommendation against initiation of opioid therapy. Now, something uh, we should all keep in mind is that simply because we are now getting the message that we shouldn't start patients on opioids long term for chronic pain does not mean that patients who have been put on long term opioids can come off easily. Um, because this has been one of the problems I think it, this was a problem we had after um, really beginning around 2012 as the medical community starts to get the message that we made a mistake. Um, and increasingly the medical community begins to recognize that there's no evidence supporting opioids as safe and effective for long-term use. And then certainly with the release of the 2016 guideline by the CDC, more doctors are getting the message that we shouldn't be putting up patients on long-term opioids. I think many clinicians have underestimated how hard it is for people to come off. And we have a very large population estimated at eight to 10 million Americans on long-term opioids who many of whom may never be able to come off of, of opioids. And we need, we really need to figure out um, strategies for helping that, that population, which is increasingly having a very hard time as their doctors retire or as their doctors start to say, hey, I don't want to do this. Or in some cases, if they're, they were getting opioids from pill mill doctor as their doctor loses their license. Um, these are patients who are having a very hard time finding doctors who will pick them up and continue them on, on sometimes very high and dangerous doses. So we, we have to find a better way to help that population. Let's now um, quickly uh, come to the uh, FDA.
uh, in 2019, the, uh, the TV show 60 Minutes did a special on, uh, on the FDA and the opioid crisis. And here, this was the, the question the, the 60 Minutes was asking, did the FDA ignite the opioid epidemic? And if you watched this episode, you'd probably uh, come away with the impression that, that they may have, they re, the, that the FDA certainly played an important role in the opioid crisis. Um, you're looking on this slide at uh, Dr. Kessler, who was a was the FDA commissioner when OxyContin was approved in 1995. He appeared on 60 Minutes basically saying that the FDA made a horrible mistake, and not simply a horrible mistake in allowing OxyContin to be approved and marketed for, for long-term use for chronic non-cancer pain, but made a terrible mistake in allowing other opioids to be um, marketed uh, as safe and effective for an ex use for an extended period uh, of time. And um, when a commissioner of a federal agency appears on 60 Minutes discussing their agency's failure leading to a public health catastrophe and, and literally hundreds of thousands of deaths, you might have expected that the next day, Congress and the committees in Congress that have FDA oversight would have put, brought in the current commissioner, put them on the hot seat and said, hey, you, the old commissioner said terrible mistakes were made that have caused hundreds of thousands of deaths, millions of cases of, of addiction. What is the FDA doing to correct this? You might have expected that would happen, but it never happened. And I think that speaks to the political muscle that the pharmaceutical industry has on Capitol Hill. What we got from Congress was, was really a, a muted response from a few members of Congress who have been champions on this issue, like Senator Markey, Senator Hassan, uh, Senator Manchin of West Virginia, um, Senator Braun, uh, uh, that that sent letters, and but but what we didn't see what was chairs of committees with FDA oversight demanding action. In 2012, so we're going to go back in time again. In 2012 was when you really start to see this rift between the medical community, the scientific community and FDA, whereas the medical community and the scientific community begin to appreciate that, you know, opioids are being overprescribed and that drug makers are promoting them as safe and effective for conditions where they're not safe and effective. And so in 2012, a group of public health officials, scientists and clinicians sent a petition to FDA, really an administrative request saying, hey, there's a real mistake with the way these drugs are labeled. Um, the label is at odds with the, with the scientific evidence. And, and the re reason that this group was petitioning the FDA, it was not so that there'd be some strict label that would limit what a doctor could do or would um, force patients off of long-term opioids. The reason there was a focus on the label is because the label is a regulatory tool. Doctors, uh, clinicians are allowed to prescribe drugs off label. And sometimes it's perfectly appropriate. appropriate. Most drugs that a, a, a pediatrician will prescribe are technically off label because the drug was never proven safe and effective for use in children. That doesn't mean that in many cases it isn't the standard of care. Um, but drug makers are not allowed to promote off-label. Off-label marketing is prohibited. And so this was a, an effort to really narrow the indication so drug makers couldn't claim that long-term use is safe and effective. The FDA responded uh, to that um, request by making some minor changes in 2013 uh, they responded by making some minor changes to opioid labels. For example, opioids had been approved for moderate to severe pain. One of the requests was to get rid of moderate. And, and so they did that. 
Um, they added some more safety language to, to opioids. But rather than really narrow the indication in the way that the group had asked, FDA said, you know, we agree with, we agree with you all that the evidence that this is safe and effective for long-term use isn't there. But rather than make the label compliant with the evidence and compliant with federal law, what we're going to do is require post-marketing studies. And so they issued these post-marketing requirements for various studies. They said, look, you're right, the evidence isn't there, so we're gonna make the drug makers get the evidence. Um, some of these studies have been done over the years. One of the studies that was never performed was a study to show that opioids are efficacious for long-term use. And just last week, FDA held a meeting, which I'll come back to in a minute, um, to discuss how to go about doing this study and the methodology that they were interested in using. This rift between FDA and the scientific community continued to grow. And in 2014, it really came to a head uh, with, when it, with the approval of a drug called Zohydro. So around 2013, I think, 2012, uh, Zohydro came up before an FDA advisory committee, that's a group of outside experts, for a vote on whether or not the drug should be approved. So Hydro is uh, an extended release hydrocodone product, and it was being brought before the committee, um, extent, it was, came in very large doses and an easy to crush pill, and the committee said, this is crazy, uh, approving Zohydro. Um, and allowing the, the manufacturer to pr promote it for, for long-term use. We don't have evidence this is safe and effective for long-term use. And we saw what's happened with OxyContin. Why would we put another drug like this on the market and allow its manufacturer to promote, promote it aggressively? They, the committee voted 11 to two to keep the drug off of the, the market. Despite that vote, FDA approved the drug anyway, and it led to an uproar. Um, be, and it's very similar to what we've seen recently with the Alzheimer's, uh, with, with a recently approved Alzheimer's medication over an objection of an advisory committee. And, and now we've got a, a problem as well because you have Medicare not wanting to, to cover the drug because it doesn't, it, it's probably ineffective. It's, um, it's certainly dangerous. Um, and, and yet Congress is saying, hey, you should approve it because some private uh, payers are, are covering it and it's, it's just a mess. Um, so similarly, you, you had uh, really a, a, a problem with when the FDA approved it over the objection of an advisory committee. You even had one state, Massachusetts, that said, hey, we don't care that FDA approved it. We're going to ban it uh, for, for use in, in our state. Sort of a flip of what we're seeing right now with um, an abortion, with, with the abortion pill um, uh, and, and, and a court uh, trying to to ban that uh, drug for beliefs that uh, abortion should be be prohibited, um, the courts ruled against what the governor of Massachusetts uh, tried to do. Um, so the governor was not able to ban so hydro, and that's that's probably a good thing. What would be a better thing is if we have an FDA that that really relies on science uh, in its policy making. In 2016, we had a new FDA commissioner come in. So I, possibly in part because of the uproar over Zohydro, uh, the commissioner of FDA uh, resigned, uh, Commissioner Hamburg. A new FDA commissioner comes in in 2015. That was Dr. Califf. He came in for a short term, really finishing up uh, Commissioner Hamburg's term. Uh, Dr. Califf um, is now our current uh, FDA commissioner, so he, he served a short term starting in 2016, and he came back as commissioner under uh, President Biden. Commissioner Califf, when he came in, uh, really, at, at least his thinking on opioids as he communicated, um, put him very much in line with the scientific and medical community. Um, he recognized that opioids are being promoted and prescribed for conditions where they're likely not safe or effective. He saw this mess, um, but rather than reining in 
the label reigning in the manufacturers, taking on the pharmaceutical industry, opening up the can of worms of all of the bad decisions FDA had been making uh, on opioids. What he did was to, in many ways, punt. Uh, he punted the ball to the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, um, NASM, um, to ask NASM to advise FDA on its regulatory role with regard to opioids. And um, some of you may have seen just last week, uh, I think it was, or actually, I think it was last, it was this Sunday, the New York Times broke a story about the National Academy of Sciences relationship with the Sacklers. And just as um, Commissioner Califf was um, seeking a report from the National Academy, the National Academy was taking millions of dollars from the, the Sackler family. And the individuals who would have been on that, that panel advising FDA were not for Senator Wyden and the Senate Finance Committee intervening with the National Academy, uh, recognizing that they were putting people on the, the panel with, with serious conflicts of interest. Um, had they not intervened, we, we would have wound up with probably a really bad uh, report. Um, instead, though, we wound up with a pretty good National Academy of Sciences report um, so that um, despite the millions that the National Academy was taking from the Sacklers for, for, for this particular report, it, it was pretty good. And it called on FDA to overhaul its opioid decisions. Um, it called on FDA to do a review of all of the approved op opioids using a new risk benefit framework and to really start taking some products off the market, or at least, you know, if you were weighing risk first benefit, some of the very high dosage products like the, you know, the 80 milligram Oxycontin, uh, for example, or, or, or the highest dose, the dose of, of Nucinta, Tepentadol, or Duragesic, all of the opioids come in these exceptionally high doses where the, the risk of that exceptionally high dose very clearly outweighs the, the potential benefit that, you know, some of these products should start coming off of the, the market. Um, that this, uh, so that, that report gets issued in 2017. Uh, Commissioner Gottlieb takes very little action on that report. 2019 is the 60 Minutes story. Um, I mentioned a muted response from Congress, but what we did see was a response from Congress calling on FDA. Uh, you had a few members of Congress who sent a letter to FDA raising concerns about enriched enrollment, randomized withdrawal, the methodology FDA had been using. And it's a methodology that has been criticized in a very recent report, uh, a new report commissioned by FDA, uh, which uh, asked FDA to take a look at how it was doing, um, implementing the National Academy of Sciences recommendations. The report criticized FDA on use of enriched enrollment randomized, with, uh, randomized withdrawal. This is a methodology that's been used for approving opioids where instead of doing a normal placebo control randomized trial, what you do is you take all of the patients who will ultimately be randomized and you give them four to six weeks of opioids. And for the patients who can't tolerate an opioid or patient who says during those four to six weeks of, for example, taking Opana, which was the first opioid used, uh, approved using this methodology, uh, you, um, you let them take the Opana for four to six weeks. For those who got sick, they didn't like the effects of an opioid or didn't find the Opana help, helpful to them, you take them out. Now you're left with a small group of people who found the Opana helpful. They said, yeah, that helped my back pain. And yeah, I, I tolerated it. And now you randomly select half of them to come off and take a placebo. And that's your active phase. That's your enriched enrollment phase. And of course, the people who are switched to placebo go into withdrawal. They have increased pain hypersensitivity. Um, but through that methodology, you can show that the that the opioid seems more effective than the, the placebo. That's the methodology that's been used for approving every opioid uh, marketed starting with Opana uh, in 2006. 
And just last week, the methodology that FDA proposed to a committee uh, to use for evaluating long-term efficacy was enriched enrollment uh, randomized withdrawal. Fortunately, FDA got an earful from its advisory committee, which said that this methodology is inappropriate, that it, in, in many ways it's um, a way of really um, cooking the books, uh, you know, fixing it so that the drug will look more effective than it actually is. And so we are still uh, to, to this day at a point where drugs are labeled in a way that does not comply with federal law. Federal laws, uh, opioids are labeled in a way that does not comply with federal law. Federal law requires that drugs have studies proving that they're efficacious. And for opioids that are marketed for long-term use, we still do not have evidence uh, of efficacy. I will stop here and, and answer questions. All right, thank you so much for that, Dr. Claudine. That was a great presentation. Um, I think the first question we can start with is um, what sort of alternatives have been considered for pain control for opioids? We have a few people in the chat or in the um, Q&A asking about the use of buprenorphine and if that's indicated. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit about some of the alternatives that are being considered. You know, uh, that's, that's a good question. And, you know, sometimes uh, I've, I've heard people say, hey, you know, what we need as a solution to the opioid crisis um, is we need to invent pain medicines that are not addictive. I hear that a lot. And, and when I hear that, I, I remind people that we have pain medicines that are not addictive. And in fact, if you even go back in time to our first, uh, our first opioid epidemic, which occurred in the late 1800s, um, bled a little bit into the early 1900s with uh, in the late 1800s, it was morphine. In the early 1900s, it was non-medical use of prescription heroin. Um, one of the reasons historians believe that that epidemic came to an end was the introduction of aspirin. Um, with the introduction of aspirin, we had for the first time a, a medication other than opioids that was efficacious for, for treatment of pain. Um, and we have more uh, uh, analgesics today. We have many studies that show that for even for severe pain, NSAIDs um, can be as effective, if not more effective than opioids. That doesn't mean every patient can take an NSAID. It doesn't mean we can throw out opioids altogether and just have NSAIDs because there are contraindications to NSAIDs. There, um, there are going to be times when we can't give an NSAID. Um, but um, even you know for, for renal colic, for, for example, which is an example of a pain condition that's ex that's just excruciating, um, we know uh, that um, NSAIDs can be are, are, are as effective with with less adverse effects than morphine, uh, and and so we can dramatically reduce our exposure to opioids. And of course, I haven't even gotten into non pharmacologic uh, approaches to to treating pain, um, which would be its own webinar. All right, thank you so much. Um, our next question is from somebody wondering about um, some sort of resources or stats regarding the intersection of gender in the opioid crisis um, and the different um, ways that affects different genders and races, if you had any insight on that. Yes, and I, and I appreciate the question. Historically, drug overdose deaths have been um, higher in men uh, than in women. We saw that in the heroin epidemic. Uh, we saw it during the crack cocaine epidemic. Um, and um, we were we saw that, we've sort of seen that through much of the prescription opioid epidemic. Um, what was unique about the prescription opioid epidemic uh, was that the gender differences, um, there was very little gender difference. So we really have seen parity between uh, and, and this is when you're looking at whites who developed opioid addiction from prescription opioid use, we've really seen a lot of parity uh, between uh, white men and, and women. Um, uh, we saw um, from 1999 to around 2012, 
because overdose deaths were already higher in men, the increase among women was much greater. So about a greater than 400% increase in opioid overdose deaths in women, prescription opioid deaths, whereas the increase in men was more around 250%. When you look at non-whites, um, and again, when you look at the population that developed opioid use disorder from, from heroin, um, that's where you see a, a much greater gender disparity. So oh, it's, it's, over, it's much more male than, than female. Um, when you look at this older group uh, of blacks, it's, it's, it's largely black men from urban areas who were in their 50s and up. Um, th certainly there are also older black women, but again, it's, it's much smaller. Um, you know, a, a good way, a good place to sort of get a sense of the epidemiology would be to visit um, a methadone maintenance program and spend some time there. And what you'd see, for example, if you were to visit a methadone maintenance program in New York City or Baltimore or Philadelphia, or, um, what, you, what you'd see are these groups, or if you look at the data from the methadone clinic, you'll see this older group of non-whites that's disproportionately male, and then you'll see this younger group of, of whites where you see a much more even uh, gender uh, distribution. Great, thank you. Um, and then I think we'll do one last question. Um, somebody was just asking if you could expand a little bit on the new proposed methodology for um, moving forward, looking at opioid efficacy studies. Yes, so um, the proposed methodology, uh, and again, I, I covered this, but I, you know, I went quickly through my talks. I am glad we have the, the question and I have um, a couple of minutes to try and answer it. Um, so I mentioned that FDA was petitioned in 2012 to narrow the indication on opioid labels, extend and release opioid labels so they can't be promoted long term as safe and effective. FDA responded by saying, we're going to get the studies. We agree the evidence isn't there. Well, for efficacy, that was never done. And just last week, the committee was presented with the FDA and the drug company's plan uh, for doing this study. And the methodology believe it or not, that they want to use is enriched enrollment randomized withdrawal. And for all the reasons that I pointed out that the methodology is terrible for approving an opioid, that it's essentially cooking the books, it's making it look like the drug is more effective um, because you're, you're comparing it to uh, in a population of patients who are going through opioid withdrawal who had found opioids helpful um, it's even worse for, for the, in the methodology that was proposed um, because instead of four to six weeks of taking an opioid and then switching to placebo, you would give patients high doses of morphine in the proposed study for 42 weeks and then rapidly taper them and then see who's got worse pain. And if, fortunately, the advisory committee um, told FDA, you know, I, I really, I think they sent FDA back to the, to the drawing board. Um, and saying that this methodology is, is inappropriate. 